Well, I was hoping someone else would finish off the last 50 vids, but it looks like I'll have to do it myself. All right then, so group one and group seven are the subject of this assessment statement. From lithium to cesium and just fluorine down to iodine. So we're just gonna look at the, the patterns within the group, not across the period, but down those vertical columns, the groups. Let's start off with atomic radii. So you've noticed that period one, period two, that's period three, period four, etc. Well, the period number is also the number of shells that the atom has. Period two, well, lithium has two shells. Period three, sodium has three shells. Period four, potassium has four shells. And so as you go down group one, you're adding a shell each time, and so the radii increases. And it's the same for group seven. Every time you go down a period, you add a shell, and the radii increases. Let me just draw that out quickly for you. And there you can see two shells for lithium, also two shells for fluorine. So the pattern is, as you go down the group, the radii of the atoms increase. And that's the same for group one and group seven. And so the next trend is ionic radii. Well, an atom that gains or loses electrons is an ion. So the metals, lithium down to cesium, they lose electrons. Metals are electrophobic. And the non-metals, well, they love electrons. They're going to take extra electrons on board. So group one metals, they become ions by losing their outer electron. And since there's only one electron in that outer shell, they actually, they actually lose the entire shell. So you can see that those shells have gone from group one. Now for the halogens, an electron goes onto them and it just causes a bit of extra repulsion in that outer shell and it puffs up a little bit. So the radio actually gets a little bit bigger for the non-metals when you add electrons. Now what's the pattern? Well, the pattern is, is just the same as atomic radii. As you go down, the ions get bigger. We're just looking at the group patterns here. They get bigger because you add a shell each time. All right, let's just put those uh, shells back on again. First, ionization energy. Well, hopefully you still remember the definition. That's the minimum energy required to remove an electron from a gaseous atom. You've got to say gaseous. There are two things that are important here. Uh, the first thing is how far away is that valence electron from the pull of the nucleus? Let's look at the valence electron in lithium. Now, the electron in lithium is close to the pull of the nucleus compared to the rest of the group there. And so if it's close to the pull of the nucleus, the electrons are negative, the nucleus is positive, there's lots of electrostatic attraction, it's going to need a lot of energy to remove it relative to cesium. The electron, the valence electron in cesium is a long way from the pull of the nucleus, and so it won't need much energy to pull that negative electron off of that, uh, away from that positive attraction of the nucleus. And the same is true for the halogens. The distance from the nucleus to the valence shell is important. In iodine, that electron is relatively far from the nucleus. It won't take much energy to pull that off compared to the rest of the halogens. It should be quite easy, a low energy. There are two things. The second thing is the shielding. Those shells between the valence shell and the nucleus are shielding the electron from the full pull of the nucleus. So in lithium, there's only one shielding uh, shell, and that means that the electron feels the pull of the nucleus quite a bit relative to cesium, where there was loads of shielding, loads of protection. And for iodine, that has the most shielding. So that electron's going to be even easier to pull off of cesium and even easier to pull off of iodine because the electron not only is far away from the pull of the nucleus, it's also shielded. And fluorine has the highest first ionization energy because it takes a lot of energy to pull that electron off. It's close to the pull of the nucleus and there's very little shielding compared to the other halogens. So it's going to need a lot, need a lot of energy to pull that electron off of there. Again, the pattern's the same as you go up the group. The first ionization energy increases. Electronegativity. Hmm, the IB keeps changing its definition of this. But it's electron love. That's how I think about it. I love electrons. Devoted my entire life to them. <sighs> okay, fluorine has the highest electronegativity. Loves electrons the most. If I use my little data booklet and copy out the numbers. 
oh, hold on, definition first. It's the measure of the attraction of an atom for the electron pair in a covalent bond. Now, for our purposes, we'll just use the first part of that definition. It's the measure of an attraction of an atom for an electron. So here are those promised values from the data booklet. Thank you, Linus Pauling, who helped to work that out. Went a little bit mad in his old age, but he did win a couple of Nobel Prizes. It's pretty, pretty good. All right, so the pattern again is the same. All these patterns seem to be the same, don't they? As you go up the group, the electronegativity increases. So if I have an electron, why is it attracted to fluorine more than anything else? Well, when the electron goes to fluorine, it can be closer to the pull of the nucleus, which is stable. And fluorine has the least shielding as well. So in no other case of the halogens can the electron get so close to the nucleus and experience so little shielding. So it's very energetically favoured. A negative electron can get right close to that positive nuclei. Now, why doesn't the electron want to go to cesium? Well, the electron isn't really attracted to the nuclei there. It's so far away when the electron comes close to cesium and there's so much shielding that the electron barely even knows the nuclei is there. So it has a low electronegativity. And finally, melting point. So the intermolecular forces are important here. The forces between one molecule and another need to be broken in the solid to melt it. Now in the halogens, that's the van der Waals forces. So if we look at iodine as an example, iodine comes in pairs, it's diatomic. And so what holds one I2 to the next I2 are these van der Waals forces. Now, van der Waals forces explain why, as you go down group 7, the melting point increases. Because more electrons means more van der Waals, and more van der Waals forces means it's going to be a high melting point. I have to put more energy in to break those bonds. So, for the group 1 metals, that's going to be metallic bonding, positive metal ions in a sea of electrons. No one can ever remember that. So looking at potassium, there's the positive ions, C of electrons, and let's compare that to rubidium. Now the ions are bigger in rubidium, it's an extra shell, isn't there? So let's look at the attraction of that electron in potassium for that potassium ion. That plus charge on the potassium ion is spread out over that surface area. But in rubidium, that plus charge is spread out over a much bigger surface area. So the electrons are, have less attraction to those positive metal ions. The electrons in the sea are less attracted. So rubidium is going to have a weaker metallic bond. So rubidium is going to be easier to melt. It's a charge density argument. Lithium's like pickled onions to cut. Sodium's cold butter. Potassium's margarine. And cesium is like Mr. Whippy ice cream. Has such weak metallic bonds. The attraction of the Electron C to the positive metal ions is much reduced in cesium. Cesium is such a big, big iron that that one positive charge is spread out over such a wide volume or such a big area as to be virtually negligible compared to the others. The patterns are backwards, so they always ask this question. You can ignore the rest of the video, just know that this is the one they always ask because the patterns go opposite.